big rock hits the earth and it, and it transforms a vast quantity of, of matter at the surface of the earth essentially into a vapor. Matthew Huber studies the history of the earth, especially the dynamics between the ocean and the atmosphere. There's a mingling of the mass of the original impactor and plus all of the surface that it vaporized. And that gets pumped up high into the atmosphere, through the troposphere, into the stratosphere, where that rock starts to condense out and, and form a solid, and it forms a, a massive layer of dust. Most of the dust will actually be high up in the atmosphere, well above where you and I might be, but it'll be very dark. Most of the sunlight will, will not make it to the surface and it'll be as dark as a moonless night. Since leaving the observatory, the scientists Noah Boyle and Xian Yatan have battled their way across the volcanic terrain of Hawaii. In the damp tropical climate of the rainforest, not all the plants were burnt, but the lack of sunlight is taking an ever increasing toll. The vegetation also suffered from the acid rain caused by the sulfuric compounds that the impact hurled into the atmosphere. These plants aren't going to make it without sunlight. pH value, 4.2. 4.2 is approximately the pH value of buttermilk. That in itself is not dangerous. But that level of acidity in the atmosphere slowly releases heavy metals from the soil and can therefore lead to dangerous levels of toxins. <laughs> We shouldn't drink this much longer. We shouldn't stay on this island much longer. In the darkness, the fertile island has become a desert hostile to life. Sunlight is our planet's indispensable source of energy. Most plants cannot exist without light, and after a few weeks of darkness, they die. This breaks the first link in the food chain. All life hangs in the balance. You all know what these are. They're plain, everyday potatoes. And I just want to show you what happens to seeds or tubers like this when they germinate in the ground. Dr. Vivi Vaida specializes in the mass extinctions that have occurred throughout the Earth's history. They thrive to break through the surface to reach the sunlight. But what happens when the sun is no longer shining? Even in darkness, seeds will germinate. In their search for light, sprouts shoot up very quickly. In the process, they use up all their reserves of energy. When they only find total darkness, they will keep on growing as pale sprouts. For some time after the impact, the ground will be covered by white sprouts and uh, from all kinds of plants. But in perpetual darkness, the plants run out of energy and they die. Matthew Huber has developed a climate model for the months immediately following the disaster. Now you might think after a while it'll rain out, it'll fall out, and, and indeed that's what happens over the course of weeks and months, the dust will settle. But the news is not as good as you might think it is. What ends up happening then is at the same time as the big rock slammed into the surface of the earth, what it was slamming into was a whole bunch of carbonate rock and, and seawater. That injected into the atmosphere a whole bunch of sulfur. And this aerosol or haze persists in the atmosphere long after the dust has settled. 
and this haze will, in time, lead to a cooling. Drawing moisture from the atmosphere, the polar ice caps grow ever larger. The climate becomes drier, and the continents freeze over. Paris now lies in the midst of an icy desert with temperatures 40 degrees Celsius below normal. The temperature remains bearable only close to the ocean. In New York City, it is just below freezing. Closer to the equator, people are totally unprepared for the extreme cold. Many of the Barca become sick. Cases of malnutrition are appearing. Lomama sees the cold white flakes of snow for the first time in his life. His language has no word for them. Where will he find food now? What was once his familiar homeland has turned into a strange and threatening world. All life seems to have been extinguished. At first sight, the situation seems hopeless. But nature is extremely resilient, and over time, it has developed many strategies for survival. The examples are endless. These are the freeze-tolerant wood frogs of Canada. They survive in our environment for eight or nine months, frozen solidly under the ground. As the frog starts to freeze, ice penetrates into the frog through its veins and arteries. Your veins and arteries are like long tubes, and what ice does is it grows down the long tubes, and it pushes the blood into the center of the frog. At this time, the heart is beating very fast. <laughs> the frogs, although not frightened, their heart speeds up and their blood flow goes very fast. But when ice eventually freezes the blood, then the heart stops, all surrounded by ice. If you have electrodes and put it into the frog brain, no brain activity at all. They are dead. If they were in a hospital, if they were on ER on television, they would be dead, flatlined. But as soon as they thaw out, the organs begin to start again. The electricity comes back to the brain and they have normal brain patterns. They don't forget what they have learned. They, they're, they're not damaged. And a, impact event far away from them that only extended winter a little bit of time, they might not even, literally not even notice. When a frog begins to freeze, it produces a large amount of glucose. This prevents the ice crystals from destroying its cells. When the frost is over, the frog thaws out and awakens to new life. 